We have a great group of people here, probably the foremost experts in the world, so please give a round of applause for Brandon Allinger, Tom Spina, Stephen Lane, Gus Lopez, and Dave Mandel. Hi everyone, welcome to Collecting Original Movie Props and Wardrobe. Uh, we'll dive right in here. This is an outline of what we've got for you today. Throughout the talk, we're going to have some slides which are just show and tell slides. So they're just showcasing a great prop or costume piece uh, that's out there in private collection. If you have questions at any time, just let us know. We are going to take questions throughout the presentation. There's a gentleman in the back of the room named Jim Mossy who's wearing a green shirt, and he is going to be manning the microphone. So if anybody's got a question, throw your hand up. Jim will come find you. Wait till he gets to you with that microphone, because otherwise we in the room won't be able to hear your question. And we're happy to answer questions throughout the whole thing. We'd love to make it an interactive talk if we can. You guys can help drive the presentation, because we are not very well prepared today. <laughs> I, I was just going to throw in really quickly. Um, this was not put together two hours ago. <laughs> this, is, this was set in stone weeks ago. And so we apologize in advance for all the Ray Liotta references. So I apologize. <laughs> But enjoy, we've been working on it really hard, not just two hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so introduction. Who wants to talk? Tom? Oh. Prop collecting. It. Prop collecting Did is a broad term. I thought we were drawing straws for this. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you kind of, you cover a lot of ground with props, and uh, it's a little tough for me because I don't have my glasses on, but I'm going to lean in a little bit. Um, so for us, Prop collecting, collecting really ranges and includes anything used in the production of the films. You know, it goes beyond just, oh, it's a blaster from a movie, or oh, that's a thing. You know, it's costumes, it's makeup appliances, it's uh, production elements like concept art or concept pieces, it's cast and crew items. There's other stuff I'm sure that's on the thing I can't read, um, but that's kind of where we come at it. It really is just about, was this part of the process in making this film that I love? And if so, does owning that give me a sense of connection to that movie? And that really, you know, in all the different types of collecting, I feel like toys are amazing, this great connection to your childhood. Uh, prop replicas are really cool and, and all sorts of art and things like that. But there's something about props that just, to me, feels like the most direct connection. And I'll pass it to one of you guys to expand. Yeah, I think I'll just go on with that. It's, it for me, it's certainly been a, an emotive journey. It's, it is that connection to the experience that I had as a youth. You know, we're talking about Star Wars. I collect other props as well, but for Star Wars specifically, it's sort of harping back to sitting in the cinema for the first time, watching the movie. And I think, uh, you know, and we'll talk about some of the, the leading uh, activities into getting into prop collecting a little bit later on, but it's sort of how do you revisit that experience? How do you reconnect with that past? And I think initially for me, it was collecting the little action figures, as so many of you are going to be familiar with, and that led into finding props. And when I found props, it was like, okay, rather than sort of uh, collecting something that's associated, this is, this is directly uh, uh, relative to a moment in time from that experience when I was in the cinema. And I think that nostalgic drive, that emotive connection is, is a driver for a lot of collectors. Yeah, one thing I'll add is, um, you know, as we cover the overview, is that in many categories of collecting, there's a term like props, and there's an analogs in other areas of Star Wars collecting where the term is used broadly. The props can, it, sometimes people refer to props, they mean also a special effects model or, or wardrobe or costume or set dressing. And so there's a whole bunch of stuff that, that gets used on film, but technically it's not a prop. Um, uh, and, and so, but sometimes it, the term's used broadly. And there are also a lot of adjacent, uh, you know, things in film memorabilia that, that, that people who collect props often get into, and we're going to cover some of that to show you. Because part of it's um, people who just love the films and want to own a part of the film, whether it's sort of a behind the scenes thing or something on screen, that's, that's for many of us like the draw of collecting in this area. Um, I was just excited to hear that they have action figures from Star Wars. <laughs> I did not know that. That's really cool. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, I was just going to say, it, you know, again, I'm repeating a little bit of what these guys have said. It is that, you know, you go see a movie, and obviously you can own a copy of the movie on VHS or eventually whatever, you know, all the different DVD, whatnot, Blu-ray now, 4K, whatever it is. But all we're all trying to do, whatever you're collecting, is you're trying to capture that original time you saw it in the theater. And that's something very, that doesn't exist. It only exists sort of in your mind somewhere. And so you're all collecting is trying to get these pieces of something. 
And I think for us, and we all got there in sort of similar but different ways, it has been this journey to have a little piece of that movie, something that for us feels like this is the way of possessing those light beams shooting up from the projector onto the screen. Um, and the beautiful thing about it is, and again, you're right, there are union terms for what makes a prop and what isn't a prop. But there are things that you could buy for under $100 that are connected to a movie that, I mean, for me, does it for me. And there's also crazy, you know, cantina masks that are gonna sell for <laughs> slightly more than $100. But one of the things that's wonderful about it, because I think sometimes, like some of the articles get bogged down in the big numbers, is one thing we want to make clear today is there's just, there's so many things you can find that can get you that same be a part of it kind of thing. The prop collecting has a, a giant breadth of stuff. And anyway. And there's, there's that buildup too though. You know, anyone who's a prop collector, for the most part, didn't jump in at a $100,000 prop. You know, like we all got started with some paperwork or with a sketch or with, you know, some production piece or a cast off or whatever. And you just, you trade up, you trade up. You You're skipping ahead, Tom. That's three slides from now. Oh, sorry. <laughs> all right, uh, Brandon, why don't you give us the next slide? Well, a cu couple more basics. Oh. Uh, so some questions that come up all the time, which we just wanted to cover right up front here is, where do these items come from? And to speak to that one, you know, with the original Star Wars films, most of them have surfaced from people that were involved with the production, right? So there's famous stories that after they finished shooting at Industrial Light and Magic, they had cardboard boxes in the parking lot that were literally filled with Death Star pieces because they had made so much of it to create all those big surface sections that they had to film with real cameras back in the day that you needed a physical model and a film camera to get an image on screen. And the guys just took it, you know, it was, it was going to the dumpster and it, they, they were all fans, you know, even, even then they, they were science fiction fans, they were people who liked films, they knew that it was a neat thing and so it, it was saved at the time not to be sold later to crazy collectors but just as a little fun memento of a project. Yeah, Star were. Wars wasn't Star Wars when they were making that yeah. movie. And, and they still right. saved it. No, they, they saved it because it was this, they was thought it was cool. something special. Yeah. But quite honestly, nobody was saving it thinking, I'm gonna put it in auction someday. Right. No, the, the, if you talk to guys that worked on movies, by the way, especially the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, it was just their job. They yeah. made this stuff. They so, didn't know they were making a lightsaber or whatever it was. Just yeah. a byproduct. I mean, it's yeah. a byproduct of the production making process. So, I mean, the, the product is the film in the can. This is the byproduct. Yeah. This stuff had no commercial value during this era whatsoever. And it was just mementos for all these guys. And some of the, the older crew members we, we, uh, we deal with still today, you know, they don't really see the, the true commercial value. They have no real interest in it. They just thought they kept it because it was cool. Another question that comes up frequently is, is where do collectors obtain these pieces? You know, where can you go to get them? Uh, we'll throw a little plug in there for Prop <laughs> Store. Steven and I are from Prop Store, and that is a source of props and costumes. Uh, there are other auctions, but they're not very good. And, <laughs> <laughs> and there, are, there is collector to collector trading. So, you know, there are groups on Facebook as there is for everything. Um, before that, there were internet forums. You know, there, there's little hubs where, where focused collectors come together to trade these items. Occasionally, there'll be something that pops up in a more open marketplace like eBay. Probably that happened more 10, 15, 20 years ago, yeah. but occasionally you'll see someone selling directly who was involved with the production on eBay or someone selling directly on You'll Facebook. see newer items on eBay and yeah. like sometimes like cast and crew things, like things that were like given or sold to people that worked on like, you know, whatever, recent Star Wars TV shows, things like that. That will show up on eBay. So eBay is still a, a place. You're just perhaps not going to find a cantina mask, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. But Others? if you're shopping on eBay, is authenticity a question? Authenticity <laughs> oh is God. a question with eBay, yes. And this is not to rag on eBay specifically, but just authenticity is a very important thing in this world. And it's interesting because, like, I know in toy collecting, of course, there's AFA. There are these third-party grading houses. It doesn't really exist in props. Um, it, it tends to be more that pieces are being authenticated by the seller or almost by, like, a community judgment sort of thing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, which can be hugely speculative, and so, um, mm -hmm. I mean, this is one of the reasons that really Prop Store came around, is because it needed somebody to sort of stand in the middle of that and actually pass a judgment on it and, and really spend the time and analyze all of the specifics, the details, and have the knowledge and understanding of the materials and the paints 
um, that we used in it. So uh, eBay is definitely a, a danger zone, but you know, like, it, like any collectible, if you do your research and actually dive into yourself and learn all the facets and the, the intricacies of it, then you can, you can definitely pick up some bargains there. Can I ask a question to the audience? I'm just curious. Does, how many people, show of hands, actually collect original props or memorabilia, like in the broadest categories here? There we go. Right. Got some yeah, hands. Yeah, that's a yeah, decent yeah. amount. That's, that's cool. They're going to go to prop store, and then like the next time we do this, it's just going to be all hands. <laughs> that's what we want. So a couple of show and tell slides here. Like I say, these are going to be sprinkled throughout the, uh, the next 45 minutes of our presentation. This is an original Rebel Fleet Trooper setup from the first film. And Dave, do you want to add anything on this one? Yeah, I mean, this is a sort of an interesting piece, and obviously it's a Star Wars piece. And one thing I would throw in, just because we are talking Star Wars props, the first movie, before, again, it had come out, before George Lucas decided to have an archive, before he ever knew he was going to, you know, one day open a museum and all that kind of stuff. In certain ways, there have often been more pieces from the early, the Star Wars movie, than from the later movies. So that if you've ever seen any of the many books or the footage from the Lucas archives, there are what seems like thousands of like, you know, biker scouts and like rebel commando things there. Whereas very few, for example, of these rebel troopers from the original Star Wars. Now, obviously there are rebel troopers from things like Rogue One and whatever, which again, speaks to authenticity. But this was sort of an interesting one in my collection in that I think it all ultimately came from the same source, but or maybe two pieces came from the same source, but it came at three different purchases. And so this is something that I've done in my collection, I think we all have, which is, and again, if you're coming from that toy world, it's kind of like, I got the helmet, then I needed the shirt, then I needed the vest. And so it was kind of a project to put it together. And so the helmet, I think, came out of auction. I think the vest came out of auction and the shirt was a private purchase or vice versa. Anyway, the specifics don't matter, but one of the sort of, most fun parts of this is like all collecting, it is a hunt. It is a hunt to kind of put it together and what you're trying to do. And I also think displaying is a big part of it as well, which is whether you like this display or you're more than welcome to not like this display. I do think this to me looks better than say a helmet sitting on a shelf and the shirt and the vest perhaps on a hanger in some way. And so again, how I like to do it, how I like to collect. Um, cool. Another one, Tom, can you tell sure. us about these? Uh, this is a, a couple of pieces of mine. Um, so I, I have two companies. One of them is Tom Spina Designs, where we do restoration of original props. We work with archives and auction houses and private collectors, and uh, you know, including the Lucasfilm archives, which is like, little kid who grew up on Star Wars, complete dream job. Like, come touch and play with the props and fix them up. Like, that's amazing. Uh, but my other company does uh, prop replicas now, and it's all licensed. We're at Booth 2518, plug. Um, and uh, one of the, the things we did recently was the Hollow Chest set. And these were all one-to-one -to, -one to the original props, and we worked with some of the original scans from Phil Tippett. Um, but around the same time we were working on this, I actually got this original armature that is the armature for the main chess guy, the guy who picks up the little yellow guy and does a body slam on him. And I was talking to Phil Tippett about it, and he said, oh, I built that armature when I was 17. It had this other character on it, and I pulled the armature out, and I built the, the, what he called Mr. Big uh, for Star Wars on it, and then we used that in Star Wars. And then he pulled the armature out of it again and gave George the puppet, but not the armature. And that's because, and this happens a ton in old movies, the armature took so much work, and it was, uh, you know, all this time hand machining and stuff. They're like, well, I'm not going to give that away. I'll just put some wire in the puppet, put that on a shelf, and I'll use this armature on a new puppet. Um, and he said, oh, I still have the thing. It's falling apart. Do you want it? I'm like, well, you know, I've, I happen to know a guy who can fix stuff. <laughs> so uh, the puppet on the right is actually the thing that he made when he was 17 in junior college for this little test film he was doing. And to the left is how he looked in Star Wars. And the, uh, the, in the center is the armature itself. And the one on the left is the Regal Robot Replica, which is my company. Um, so yeah, it's, a, it's, it's one of those things like Dave said, you know, there's any number of ways to display this. This being the insides of something, to me, it's about like, how do I give this context? 
And I thought this was a cool way to do it. And, and to have the history of the piece side by side, I think just really felt neat to me. This next one is The Mandalorian. I can't remember if this is season three or season five. What is this? Uh, it's a, <laughs> it's, it's Ret Return of the Jedi. Oh, sorry. oh yeah, yeah. Of I, have, the... I haven't seen that one. Easy, Jedi, to, easy to confuse say. those things. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the stunt backpack from Return of the Jedi. Uh, the stuntman, Dickie Beer, is the one who, uh, who wore this. It's very interesting in the scenes in Return of the Jedi where Boba Fett is the outdoor scenes. There's actually three different backpacks that happen in, in a very short period of time. You have the, the hero prop, which is, you know, really detailed, you know, metal, well, you know, well painted, you know, one that presumably Jeremy Bullock would wear, and then there's a pyro version, uh, the pyrotechnic version, which had the flames coming out and all of that when the stuntman, you know, sort of goes across and hits the sail barge. And then the, this one, which was designed for the stuntman to roll into the Sarlacc pit because, you know, it, you didn't want to have like a big metal backpack that's going to like cut him. And they already had enough injuries on Return of the Jedi. A number of guys broke their legs going into that Sarlacc pit. Um, and and, and so, uh, so, yeah, so they had to be careful. So it's, it's built of like, it's like a hard like foam biscuit and has a few metal parts, but, but uh, it has, it's really detailed. And, um, and actually, if you want to see it, uh, in the um, Boba Fett to Bo-Katan exhibit with Rancho Obi-Wan down the hall, third floor at the other end, we have this, this is on display. Several of us brought our collections to, uh, to share with Steve Sansu's collection to show, show people here and show like the history of Mandalorian collectibles. And so you can see this in person. Awesome. Pretty cool. Right, mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. So gateway collectibles, I think we covered this a little bit in our opening, but I think... Most people who collect this category called props got started in some other way. Um, and common sort of gateway drugs would be replica props, <laughs> things like Don Post masks or costumes. That was my gateway. <laughs> uh, movie posters is a common one, and of course action figures as well. So I think probably everyone sitting up here and many other collectors that we know all started somewhere else, but eventually sort of made their way to props. Totally should have put a Regal Robot replica prop in there when we did that, <laughs> just for next time. You do the but slides, there's also, Tom. There's a good, there's a good reason for that, though, as well, isn't there? I mean, the, uh, ultimately, props and costumes haven't been readily available like all these other collectibles have been for so long. Yeah. And so there's a reason why it's a gateway. Is, is generally speaking, most of the collectors I know were collecting something else because they weren't aware that you could collect a prop or costume. And then while they were mixing in those communities, collecting those other things, they stumbled across it. And that's what happened with me at toy fairs. I was suddenly seeing toy, uh, props turn up. And I was just like, where, where's this come from? Where, where, where do I find this stuff? And that was really how it, I got introduced to it, and that was the reason behind it. So this obviously going back a few years now. It's a mm -hmm. little bit different now. I was going to just throw in, I mean, if you'll allow the, the O word, obsessive. You know, I started <laughs> in toys. And so, you know, you have your toys that you were a kid. And then when you're a little older and you're like, okay, I'm going to rebuy them all. And I'm going to have them, you know, mint on the card. And then I'm going to have them mint on the card and they're going to be unpunched. And I'm going to make sure I get every variation, and oh, I've got to get this one, I've got to get this one, oh, I've got a vinyl cape Jawa. But at some point, you do run out of that. <laughs> you do hit the wall where you just look one day and you kind of go, I think I have every variation they've ever done. And yeah, people are still coming up with a couple of more variations of small head, short arm, or whatever, but you are, there is a little bit of looking for that next Star Wars thing, and I think for some of us, over on this end, <laughs> um, we kind of, we made our way through some certain things and then just kind of one day was like, oh, ha, props. And that was a little bit of that for at least you just, over here. Yeah. You just sound like you're chasing a high, man. I mean, are we going to have to have an intervention, Dave? <laughs> There's no analogy to that. No, um, you know, for me, it was, it was toys also. And, and another aspect was that, um, you know, I was, I, you know, I'd been collecting toys for many years. I was getting into more advanced toys and toy prototypes. And some of that stuff was getting so pricey that I was like, okay, if we're now in this price range, you can own things from the films for less. Like part of it for you was just a budget thing. It was mm. it, not that props are always cheap, They're, they rarely are, but, but it was, it was it, the toy stuff got so expensive that it, it opened me up to other things that were starting to go, go up. And, and also, you know, like many collectors, I believe in evolving your collection and, and, and refocusing and, uh, and I found that if I let go of some things that had appreciated a lot, it, it let me you know, fund my war chest to go buy some, some Star Wars props. Just a reminder, any questions, just throw your hand up. You can put your hand up anytime. Jim will come find you in the back, and we're happy to answer. Looks like we've got a question over there. So when, when Jim gets there, you ask. But we'll, we'll, until then, Stephen will tell us about this next piece on the screen. 
Oh, cool. Yeah, so uh, talking of toys, of course, uh, here we have uh, from Empire Strikes Back. This is the Luke Skywalker uh, force jump puppet. So this is from the sequence in the carbon free freezing chamber uh, where Vader is trying to trial, trial it on Luke. And uh, there's this one super fast shot where Luke drops down into the chamber and then pops back up very quickly using the force. And this is the puppet that was used for that. It's a great thing. You can actually see it on screen if you go frame by frame. I mean, literally frame by frame. You can just get one or two frames of this. And this is where they've taken, uh, to save on time and save on budget, they've actually repurposed the action figure that was produced from Star Wars and then custom made the costume out of like gaffer tape and paint and things like that. It's just phenomenal how basic it is, but how well it works on screen. It's, it's, a, it's a great thing. I, mean, I basically own Luke Skywalker right there. So I'm glad <laughs> I was just going to throw in that is sort of an interesting point in the sort of, again, the, the, the series of the original three movies where everything for the original movie they had to basically make from scratch because there was, they couldn't go to the model store and buy an X-Wing model. So as you go further down into Empire and then Jedi, you are starting to find them using the Star Wars toys, the Star Wars model kits and whatnot. But what's amazing, what makes them props is sort of like this. It's putting a handmade uniform on it or repainting it or taking a, uh, a model kit and repainting it in the ILM shops or adding lights to it or whatever. And again, that is what sort of, again, as we're trying to sort of define what is a prop, I think that is the difference between say, the to it's not just a toy, they took it and made it into this other thing, which I think a little bit helps define it a bit in a cool way. Question? Yeah, hi. So basically you said um, a big part of this hobby is like hunting, right? Have there ever been pieces that you saw, you had the opportunity to buy it, you thought about it too long, and gone, and then you regretted it? Do you ever have any pieces where you like, sometimes you wake up in the middle of the night and you're like, oh man, I should have bought this one. <laughs> I feel like you're describing all collectors. <laughs> I feel you hadn't seen. Done that. <laughs> it definitely happens, definitely happens. Yeah, 100%. Uh, this, is, this is an original Stormtrooper costume from Return of the Jedi. Um, and what's really nice about this is that it's, it's complete head to toe, including the original undersuit and even the little neck seal, uh, the rib neck seal under the helmet and the little hood that they wore. Um, the blaster's original, the helmet's original. It's all dirtied down for the endor scenes that they shot at the, that was the last part of Return of the Jedi's production when they were filming up in the Redwoods after they had these suits clean at Elstree Studios for the Death Star sequences. Another question? Do any of your props, have they ever been um, acquired by set hunting, like in Tunisia, or picking up any, mm -hmm. any things that are uh, laying around from old sets? Yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, um, yeah I, I, several of us have been to some of the locations, and uh, it isn't really props that you find there, it's leftover set dressing. Uh, but, um, but yeah, uh, I went to Tunisia uh, in 1998 was the first time I went there. I've gone there uh, four times now. And, uh, and they found a, a lot of stuff, literally at one trip, a ton of stuff because we filled a container full of stuff. They had sold a lot of the episode one set to a local guy for scrap. And so a friend and I just packed it up in a container and shipped. We still have it, like a, a whole bunch of it. We, we've sold some of it, we kept some of it, but it was just so much set dressing for episode one. But it's also other locations. Um, there are some people this week are going to go, I know, and then several of us have gone to the filming location for Return of the Jedi for the Sarlacc pit. And, and when you go there, you're not supposed to do this, but we all do this. Uh, you, you can dig there and find pieces of the Sarlacc pit or the sail barge. It's still buried. There's still so much of it. It's not, you know, they're nondescript pieces, but, um, you know, one time at, at Celebration 4, Brandon and I did a panel on the locations. Uh, the Star Wars locations, and I, I happened to have gone to this location uh, a few days earlier and had a huge box of parts from the Sarlacc pit. And at the end of our talk, we gave one to everybody in the audience, like one by one, and we had so many of them that everybody got, got a piece of it. So anyway, if you were to go there today, uh, it's called Imperial Sand Dunes. It's on the border of Mexico, California, and Arizona. Um, right there, they, there's still stuff buried there. Uh, yeah. Just, just a minute just gonna, expectations, gonna, no giveaways. Yeah, I was going to say, we have nothing we for you today. Sorry. I mean, you're going to get a start. This mask is staying with yeah, us. Oh. 
Uh, I was going to say, I have a piece in my collection where I did not go to the set, but certainly there was a group of people growing up uh, in Northern California that were obsessed with Star Wars and would like dumpster dive at like the old uh, Kerner ILM place. And so I have like pieces, they've been, you guys have had them in your auction and stuff and whatnot. I have like a like sort of a like Joe Johnson drawing or remember it's a, and a Ralph McQuarrie drawing where like you can see somebody crumbled it up, threw it in the garbage, and then some kid jumped into the dumpster, got it out, smoothed it out, and then 30 years later, I'm in the idiot buying it in an auction. And, and, but yeah. and that was literally consigned by the kid yeah. who used to go with his dad to ILM, and they just had like some plastic grocery bags full of paper, and it was just miscellaneous scraps, and in and amongst that were some drawings that could be identified as Ralph McQuarrie drawings. And so it's a crazy story. Incredible. And it's Brandon, there's also the, the, the bunker, the indoor bunker. Oh, gosh. That. The, the yeah. bunker fence. Yeah. Yes. Like yes. Brandon and I did a trip years ago where Brandon had contacted somebody who worked on the crew of Return of the Jedi. And after the film, he actually used the panels from the indoor bunker as his backyard fence. Like we actually have photos of him and his back, Brandon standing in front of the, his backyard fence. And we... We bought the panels from him, and we paid for a new fence, and uh, we drove down and picked it up. So, uh, you know, speaking of authenticity, a big part of getting started, if anybody's interested in getting started, is just educating yourself and just understanding the nuances of props and costumes. Uh, and so a couple of resources we would recommend. There's some very good books, uh, very good books. Um, Brandon, on... how, how good is that book on the left, the costumes <laughs> book? Is that a good one? Uh, it's all right. There's... <laughs> Uh, but there's, there's some great books on prop and costume reference specifically. There's some bro books that are broader, like The Making of Star Wars, which just has good general information on the production, will we'll tell you, it'll sort of give you a sense of the mindset at that time. Um, and, you know, fortunately, Star Wars continues to be studied uh, almost endlessly, and there are still books that are coming out. There are new documentaries that are released. You know, they'll do a documentary on The Mandalorian, and there's, there's footage in there that nobody's ever seen from the classic yeah. film. So it's part of the fun of, of prop collecting is also just the research journey, and sort of building your collection of reference materials, I think, is a big part of that for, for collectors. So on this table, how many of you have bought a book just because it had one new Star Wars photo in it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? like, I mean, that was the thing. There was no, inter that, no, no internet, no way to get this. If you saw a book and it had a photo of a prop you hadn't seen before, you were buying that book. I was, I was also going to say um, the book that would, can you go back one? Sorry, really quick. Sorry. The, book, the Rinsler book, which is mm. on the end there, which is the making of Star Wars book. One of the things about that making of book, or by the way, if you're interested in other movies too, and just yeah. sort of prop collecting in general, Reading the stories, especially these better stories of how these movies were made, where they do get into the detail, sometimes of key sequences or work from the prop guys or the special effects, there will be, even if you're not getting the photo of the hero prop or whatever, there will be details and story details, or I'm sorry, I shouldn't say story details, there will be prop details in the information in these making of books that you're surprised when later on you bump into something and go, Oh my gosh, that they mentioned sense. that, that that piece lifted up. And I, I, again, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm vamping, I'm making up the examples, but it, th there is real valuable information in those making of things. Personnel, dates, Timing, where yeah. and when, what, where, how things were done that can help you sort of with, is this real? Which is yeah. really the central yeah, question. Yeah, you know, it's like, yeah. oh, we used this this way, and then we repainted it for this. And, right. well, if it shows up at, at auction right. somewhere, and, and it looks like color. the first one, yes. then it's like, well, no, that doesn't make any sense. Or it explains why it looks a certain way and not the way it looked on I, the movie. I would also say that when you understand the broader context of the filmmaking process, it really enhances the appreciation that you have for mm -hmm. these pieces. And when you start to read the stories of, let's say, like Rick Baker and Doug Beswick, Doug Beswick, who did the Cantina Band Member Mask, once you sort of know who that is, and then you understand that this is coming direct from his collection, you have that much more of an appreciation for it. And I would actually say that the Rinsler books in particular probably helped raise the profile of collecting props and certainly production artifacts, things like call sheets and you know whatever behind the scenes documents and photographs that and, and even this whole wave of interest on Facebook where people sort of name all the crew members and know all the crew members I mean that really didn't exist before those books so it's um yeah it's uh, if, if you love it and you love Star Wars and I think you'll you'll get pulled into that side of it as well the, the behind the scenes side Dave, do you want to talk about your podcast? Oh, sure. Uh, for those of you that might be interested, and Lord knows we talk about a lot of Star Wars stuff, uh, I co-host a uh, podcast uh, almost every week with uh, Ryan Condal, who is the uh, 
uh, showrunner from House of the Dragon, Game of Thrones uh, show coming out this fall. Um, and we basically talk props. Usually there's a topic each week. It's on Apple, Spotify, and whatnot. We have guests. I think everybody at this table <laughs> has been a guest at one point or another. Um, and we try and we, we sort of try and mix it up. We will do episodes where we will bring on a prop person. We'll bring on a collector of movie poster art. Ex you know, just all sorts of different ranges. We've talked, for example, with Gus, we talked about cast and crew items, which he has a wonderful collection of, just the different things that are made for the crew guys. Um, we've talked about the auctions, you know, with the, certainly the, right now we've got the new show up right now is going through the prop store catalog, just kind of talking about what we think about these pieces as we're kind of seeing the catalog for the first time. Tom's been on talking about display and restoration. So things that are interesting, things that I think can help you get into it, and things that people kind of dig. But uh, yeah, please check it out. One, one of the great things about their podcast is it's supposed to be about movie props in general, but um, but both Ryan and Dave are so into Star Wars that it, it's really <laughs> sometimes feels like a Star Wars prop podcast because they, these guys, a pilot, they find yeah. a way to talk about Star Wars, it seems like about 80% of the time, which is awesome. Question out there? Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, for each of you. What would you consider your holy grail prop or your unicorn that is maybe hmm. something that you've already found or that you are like still looking for? Uh, actually, you know, uh, if anybody's seen the Michael McMasters, I think it is, the probe droid uh, yeah. that he's built down on the floor, uh, it's phenomenal in the droid builders area. That droid isn't known to exist anywhere. I mean, that would be like a holy grail item. I mean, that's a phenomenal piece of kit, and it's most likely just got trashed at the end of Empire Strikes Back. Similar, probably to IG88. Yeah, I don't think IG88. Yeah, it's yeah. just it's gone. So something like that for me would be just like yeah, that, that would be up there for sure. Anybody else? Yeah, I'd love to find one of the. Uh, maybe you guys have located one, but one of the lightsabers with the spinning rods from the first film, oh, with yeah. the reflective, like you know, a dueling lightsaber from the first movie, would be phenomenal. Um, and there might be some, uh, Brandon, you might know in the archives if they have any. I've not heard of any surfacing. N n certainly none that still have that yeah. mechanism intact. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was going to say, and I, I, I don't think anybody ever finds their holy grail. You find it, and the second you find it, you then just come up with a different holy grail. So um, I, mine, I think, is purely unobtainable, but I guess in the grand scheme of we're all going to break into George Lucas's house and steal something, um, which I need your help on. Um, uh, it, would, it, would, it would be, you know, probably the, you know, the original Millennium Falcon miniature, if I had to just pick something, basically, yeah. yeah. Um, that being I, said, these guys all have stuff in their collection, and I'd like to think vice versa that I would murder any one of them. <laughs> and, I, and I mean that from the bottom of my Good heart. Know, yes. oh, thank you. If any of them turn up dead or George Lucas is robbed, it wasn't me, is all I'm saying. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. Tom? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh I, I'll tell you what, I'm very lucky to have one of these in a pair of hands from Doug, who became a friend over the years just as, as a fellow monster maker. and. Uh, to me, that's absolutely a holy grail. I, you know, there's certainly other stuff I would love to have, but it's really hard to beat that. And, uh, and the first, one of the first real props I ever saw, Disney World had a display. It became Pizza Planet, and now it's Pizza Rizzo. But it was just this nondescript brick building, and I walked in it, and again, no internet, no idea, 89, 90, and there's a props display. And I had never seen a real prop in my life, and I turn a corner, and I'm like face to face with a band guy that Doug had lent Disney for the display. And it was just like, oh, Everything is all over now. This is it. Like, that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. So pretty cool to, to have that. Yeah. I have a real specific one, which actually Stephen has a version of in this little puppet. But um, I'd like to have the Mark Hamill Best Spin Fatigues costume from mm -hmm. The Empire Strikes Back. And mm -hmm. the reason I call that out is because you see it go through different stages of distressing in the movie. It gets more and more beat up. And all those distressed ones are not around. Lucas the Archives has one of them, and it's a clean version. So it's like, where Where's are those rest? distressed mm. jackets? That's out, when right? that shows up. Yeah, mm -hmm. I want it. Mm -hmm. uh, another show and tell. By the way, we Ooh. should probably try to pick up the pace we a little bit. We had a question also. Yeah. Okay, question. Um, I've heard that uh, sometimes when a prop is lost, it's because uh, they would have contracted out an outside prop house, and a lot of the time the props would just go back. 
Mm -hmm. And are there significant items that uh, have been lost that way? And sometimes they would go back and they just get dismantled and completely lost. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think the famous story with those is, is BAPTI, which was the armory that provided the, rep the, the guns, which were actually real guns that shot blanks on set for the Star Wars movies. And because they were real firearms, they basically dressed them up with parts and pieces and extra scopes and such to be Star Wars props. And at the end of filming, they stripped them back to the base guns and they you know, went on being regular guns. So there is stuff like that it's also very speculative you know there's so many things especially from that first movie that just no one knows where it is today so there may be an assumption that it went back to a prop house or was broken down but it, nobody it, it also might turn up in a month that yeah. someone had a lot of costumes as well but no but costumes of Burma, it's Burma's yeah, it's costumes, costumes yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. But honestly it's it's not so much they went to the rental house and they got lost it's actually a lot of times they went to the rental house and that's why they got found because if they had stayed with the production they would have been trashed but because it went back to the rental house, they were out, the they, out in the wild. Maybe someone found it on a rack. Someone rented it for their movie, whatever, and it just, you know, it wound up turning up later. So Yeah, I think yeah. Berman's and Nathan's, uh, which is now Angel's, mm. the costume house in London that uh, did the costumes for A New Hope, they have eight miles of costume rails. And so <laughs> even today, they are still finding things with labels in that have Star Wars in. So, I mean, it's still out there, and it's exactly why some, so much of this stuff is out in the wild. And a good, few... Good question. Uh, a uh, few quick ones. Uh, the Jap any of the Japur snippets and uh, Alec Guinness's original robe. Do you know where those are? Uh, well, the the Alec Guinness costume is in the Lucas Archive. What was the first thing? Japur snippet. Japur snippet. I don't think Episode I know what that is. Thing. That's the necklace. Yeah, necklace. That I got from you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Gus, Gus has it. There you go. That, you was easy. Gus Gus has. that does Gus not has. exist. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next so, one. We got a little monster here. Dave, you're oh, monster? I guess that's oh, me yeah. too. Um, uh, I guess it has a name, Diagora or something Diagora. nowadays, but it's, you know, Trash, trash monster. monster, come on. <laughs> um, uh, I'm an old man, it's Trash Monster. Um, this was a piece that uh, came out of um, uh, prop stores. Was that the Phil Tippett auction? Yes, was that yeah. what that was? So it was them selling off um, stuff from Phil Tippett's collection. And this is, uh, this is what's interesting about this piece is it had, uh, I, it had previously been around but the eyeball had sort of gotten buried in it. And actually, Mr. Tom Spina and his company did a restoration on it. We're able to kind of suck the eyeball back out and kind of getting it looking like this. I won it in the auction, and then Tom built the display for me that you're seeing, which is, has sort of a little trash suggestion to it. So a lot of different parts of sort of the prop world in terms of an auction house, a restorer, and also a guy who worked on the movie keeping stuff and then years later deciding it is time to sell. So I think it, it kind of tells a lot about the prop world. And I think we're gonna go about two slides a minute from here on out, so. This is, this, I love this piece, Stephen. Oh my God. Why don't you talk about it, man? You, you got this, is a, <laughs> this is a Tuscan Raider mask from the first film, and it's actually that exact mask that you're looking at in the photo there, which is the main Tuscan Raider in the movie played by Peter Diamond. Um, you can tell it's that one because all the bandages on them are unique. So uh, Gus, for example, has another Tuscan Raider mask, slightly different bandage pattern, and matches That's how a different I match one. Match that one. It's, they're, they're all unique, and they're only and four. They only made four. Only four. four. I know yeah. we want to do a lot of slides, but screen matching on hmm. props where you can. Does everyone understand what or know what screen matching is? Does that make sense, or should we? Basically, it's the idea of, especially now with like 4K stuff, where you can take a freeze frame and match up. Sometimes it's wood grain, sometimes it's bandages, sometimes it's a scratch, a paint a tear, chip, whatever. Yeah. But those are the things as much as anything where when we can find them as, whether we're prop sellers or prop buyers, that's the, that's the holy grail, I guess, to be able to go, that is that one, is like how you know yeah. I mean, yeah. just dead certainty. And yeah. because this is handmade, there's all these unique little fabric uh, folds in the fabric around the mouth, and you can see, like, if you look over the character's right eye, you see that bandage running in a diagonal. I can't highlight it for you because I don't know. And, how to and do even that. the metal yeah. metal pieces They're on unique, the mouth are unique. different for each yeah. one, so that you can even match just on the, and the metal cheek tubes on the cheek yours tubes. are different than the yeah. other two. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the other three rather. Death Star, you guys have heard this story. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just the Death Star. Just the Death Star. I mean, yeah, the, the brief version of it is it, it was in a storage facility while they were doing the film. They didn't want to pay rent on it. It got thrown out, uh, as did who knows what else. Like, lots of stuff got thrown out after the production. And somebody who was working there had let his mom sell it at a, at a, at a small, like, antique shop in Lake of the Ozarks, Missouri. 
and then it changed hands with some collectors and who, I, who, who had actually saved it pretty much from destruction because after it changed hands in Lake of the Ozarks, there was a music shop that bought it. And I, I, don't, I don't think when they bought it, they knew what it was because when the shop went out of business, they had sold everything in the shop but the Death Star, which was in the corner of the music shop and the, the dish on it was missing and they used it as a garbage can. <laughs> so these guys, these three collectors, uh, Todd Franklin, Pat Franklin, Tim Williams, they bought it and, and saved it and had it in their living room for a decade. And I knew them and, then, and it was a really great story, but I did tell them, and this is often how we acquire these pieces, is you know, I don't like to pry from people's collections, but I do make it known sometimes, like, if you ever did decide to sell it, let me know. And that was the case there. They had decided that they wanted to sell it. And I also told them, you know, that it would go to a good home and that I won't sell it and you can come visit, you have visitation rights forever. <laughs> that often factors in deals, by the way. <laughs> so I'm going to try to zip through this pretty quickly just so we can keep showing fun things. But, you know, some things to watch out for. Uh, fakes, you know, ha having a focus. Um, we show some fakes here. I mean, this is a Biker Scout gun which has floated around in the past. It looks nothing like a real Biker Scout gun. In fact, I think it's molded off the toy. The I, no, the I think the Kenner one looks better than this. Like, <laughs> yeah. This yeah. is yeah. really bad. The, but Kenner one is the Kenner one looks good. really close, actually. Yeah. Yeah. This, Gus, what's the story? Yeah, and the one? idea is, you know, the props the name, only, like, to, yeah, I mean, it's like set, sometimes they'll cut up costumes or set dressing or something like that. I s sort of uh, put it in there to, to say, you know, some people like this because you're owning a piece of the film, yeah. but it isn't like, if you didn't have an explanation, you wouldn't know what it is. And I have a few pieces like this, and, and for some people it's a fun way to collect, but I, I make a big distinction of that kind of thing cut up versus, you know, something that's recognizable. And then we often talk about the mom test of, oh, that's yeah. a real high tier oh, of, of a prop, like something that you know, the really high bar is like you show the piece to your mom who may or may not know much about Star Wars and knows exactly what it is. No, uh, my, my mom can recognize yeah. a Stormtrooper helmet, but when my mom sees that, she hated the prequels. So she just <laughs> says that's just, that's just garbage. So, yeah. uh, and so j just to highlight some sort of uh, very nice, very recognizable, but more entry level pieces that do come up more often and are more accessible. Uh, from a budget perspective, you know, these are original pieces of Death Star Surface, which are fairly readily available. You know, these, these yeah. come up quite frequently. As it and said, lots of sizes. They go, yeah. From, yeah. they go from very small to very large. And yeah, certainly three inches to two feet. Very small. Yes, it is small, but it is a piece of the Death Star, which is, yeah. I think, a, a different than whatever thing. that other thing was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, R2-D2 bits and pieces, we've seen some of these float around in the past. Here's some production paperwork, which is kind of an adjacent category. Script and original storyboards, again, it's directly part of the process. It's things that you're reading about in that Rinsler book. Um, here's some, what I would consider to be more recognizable prequel pieces. Prequel pieces in general, more accessible than original yeah. trilogy pieces. Uh, these are very nice. Some so I'll just jump in there and say, the demand, we're seeing the demand for prequel pieces come up now as well as, as people who watched and grew up with the prequels are aging, have more disposable income, are going, again, going, want to go on that journey and revisit that experience of seeing it. Yeah. So that, that is definitely a growing market. Yeah. Costume pieces, this is some of the things that Stephen was referencing, like the types of things that could be found in a costume house today because they're somewhat nondescript, but these are original Star Wars pieces, the Bespin Guard jacket and the Rebel Police. Wasn't there a, there was a thing years ago where like, was it like some of the Imperial uniforms were like in like a costume collection as like Oriental Butler, which oh obviously is both racist and horrible, but also it was from Star Wars, which I is kind of crazy. I think it was the Bespin Guard jacket. But was it the Bespin yeah. Guard jacket? Okay, so yeah, so yeah. <laughs> Uh, we, we talked about set visits. These are crate dragon bones, which again float up from time to time. A number of different fans have gone out and found some of those, and, and they do get sold. So, you know, there, there are some pieces that are not, not quite as obscure as that carpet fabric sample that we looked at. <laughs> Maybe slightly obscure, but still, I mean, something like the Death Star, I would say, is pretty instantly recognizable. Yeah. You know? Certainly to a Star Wars fan. Maybe not Dave's mom. <laughs> uh, we'll do some more show and tell slides. So. Yeah, uh, this is a piece from my collection. This is the skiff guard staff, and it's not Lando's staff, even though Lando's is very similar, but a bunch of the different skiff guards in the Return of the Jedi battle had these things. They're all kind of made in a, a similar visual aesthetic, and this one is that actual one there in that behind-the-scenes photo that that guy is, uh, is handling. Yeah, Damn. This one, any guesses? <laughs> Steven? Yeah, okay, I mean, it, you, you, I mean, you all know what it is already, but I mean, this is a, a screen-matched Empire Strikes Back, Darth Vader, hero lightsaber, belt saber. This particular uh, lightsaber went on a journey uh, that ended up 
having it positioned on the wall in a casino in Aurora, Illinois, of all places. It popped up on the RPF, I think it was. There was a yes. discussion about some of the guys who said, oh, this sort of seen a photo of this, this looks like the real thing. And uh, I chased it down from there and managed to do a deal with the casino, which is not easy to do, I can assure you. Um, but, <laughs> was this uh, the one with the James Bond suit or something that yeah, you had to yeah, find yeah, them? Yeah, they the, wanted a James Bond suit in exchange or something crazy like yeah, that? Yeah, but, but when this happened, Casino Royale had just come out. The CEO of the casino, I'll try and make this as brief as possible, massive James Bond fan. And basically, I had agreed a deal for the Sabre, and we had a contract in place. They wouldn't execute it. They wouldn't sign it until I'd found them a Daniel Craig tuxedo from Casino Royale, which in itself was quite a challenge to do. Uh, luckily, there was a charity event where the uh, Eon Productions had donated one. I went to the charity auction, bought the suit, and the very next day, we did the deal. So, so I was trying to keep that brief, but it was a great story. It's a really yeah. good story. Yeah. I have a question out there. Question? question. Yeah. Jim, Jim will make his way over to you for the question. Yeah. Uh, the next section, I think we should spend a few minutes here because these are good stories. A lot of the fun of collecting, and especially collecting this type of content, is just the finding things and the things that do turn up in odd places. So we have, we have a few good stories to share here. Uh, Dave, can you start, start us this off? This was really my first piece. You know, we were talking about like when you first sort of realize there's, uh, you know, like props out in the world. This was a Stormtrooper helmet from Jedi that showed up in the old Toy Shop magazine, the upper left corner is just a little ad that was in the classified section, the back of Toy Shop. Um, and for those young people, magazines are things on paper that used to come out <laughs> semi-regularly. And uh, basically, I was a subscriber to Toy Shop because I was buying action figures. And all of a sudden, I saw there's a Stormtrooper helmet. And I won the auction. It was like a phone auction. It was for at now what seems like nothing. Um, but I bought the piece. Basically, the guy agreed I was allowed to buy it, but I was going to then show it to Steve Sansweet. And if he said it was okay, then we had a deal. So then I was like, I have to figure out how do I get to Steve Sansweet, who luckily at the time was living in LA, and I was able to sort of get it to Steve and kind of um, show it to him, and we matched it up against his, but it was my first prop, and it was a crazy learning experience because I threw myself in at the time, which would have been... 1997, does it say seven? It six. six, okay, I was gonna say seven, but six, yeah. Um, I was, anyway, uh, it was just basically 96, and basically, you know, the internet wasn't quite the internet. I, it was just every book, every picture I could to kind of like, you know, sort of, how do I know this is real? Because I was, I was frightened, is the honest yeah. answer. I was scared. Very cool, very cool. Gus, do you wanna tell us Yeah, I'll tell this story briefly. The, um, so this, every once in a while, like, you know, we, we all hunt for props, but sometimes the props find us. And there was a fellow who uh, had contacted me uh, at, at an email address I actually don't regularly use, so I, I didn't see his email until a year after he sent this, oh so, <laughs> which <laughs> itself is a good story. But anyway, I, I, uh, I read his email. He said, oh, I have some props from Star Wars. And, uh, you know, I get a lot of those. And oftentimes it's like a Don Post mask or something else. They, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're not mm -hmm. clear. They don't understand that it wasn't used in the movie. So I said, okay, well, send me some pictures. And I thought he would send me like JPEGs and email, but he didn't really do you know, really, you, you know, have a digital camera or anything. So he sent like old, you know, uh, film photos that, that he had taken in the 90s or 80s of these pieces. And it, and it was of these two pieces. It's uh, a Tuscan Raider from A New Hope and also Luke's belt from A New Hope. And I get them in the mail. And even from these crude old photos, I could screen match it to uh, like the Luke belt. Every scene that Luke's wearing the belt, I could screen match it. And I was like, oh my God, this guy. And his story was... He was a truck driver who used to move haul things between the different prop studios. And he said that, you know, he got to know Lucas, and this is presumably the same storage facilities or whatever they were using that they ended up throwing everything away. And, and I think it was just before the film came out, he said, you know, hey, I'd love to get that, that creature mask. And then Lucas grabbed it for him and also said, here, take Luke's belt. And so he just kept these things for years, and they were both perfect screen matches. And rumor has it, to this day, if you meet George Lucas and say, I would like a creature mask, <laughs> he has to give you stuff. He, he has, has no to. choice. Yeah. yeah, no, that is... Yeah. 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 yeah, and that's why he won't come on your podcast. <laughs> question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so when you find a piece that's, uh, like you said, a helmet that's a missing eyepiece, at what point do you draw the line between fixing it and mm. leaving it out it is? Mm. And at what Fishing. point do you 
Because if you fix enough, does it become not authentic? And at what point do you draw that line, I guess, is my question. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think it's down to the individual, but we probably all share a pretty similar viewpoint on that, which would be that, you know, you want to preserve the integrity of what you had there. You don't want to modify it into something else. You certainly don't, you know, like for us, the nightmare is to meet a guy who says, oh, it was kind of beat up, so I think I'm going to repaint it. Right. It's like, no, don't, please don't repaint it. You know, <laughs> so we, we want to see that worn finish. So I think when you can sympathetically restore things where you improve the aesthetic without harming the originality, yeah. that's sort of the like optimal Like visual balance. completion. Mm. You know, if you've got a stormtrooper with missing ear caps you know if you can safely add those on without damaging the piece or hurting it maybe you do it and then it's a question of do you add them on in a way where they look aged and blend in with the piece do you add them on in a way where maybe they are specifically a different color so that you're not lying yeah to I have a, I have an almost complete but not complete stormtrooper suit and the pieces that I'm missing I got castings of an original Stormtrooper suit, but I did them in sort of a gray color, like kind of when you go to a museum and you see a dinosaur, but they don't have all the bones. The fake bones are a different color. And so I did that. So I have a Stormtrooper display, and a couple of pieces are gray, but that's, yeah. that's what made me comfortable. And it's really, it is very much a personal choice. But I do think as long as people are disclosing things, because where the yeah, problem you get into yeah. is I put a fake piece on something to make it look better, I sell it, two other guys sell it, whatever, whatever, and now all of a sudden people sort of have forgotten the story. Yeah, yeah, That's the yeah. part that I get bummed out about a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Stephen, do you want to talk about the helmet and then we'll take the next question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. So we were talking about grails earlier on. This was a grail for me for a long time, uh, ATAP driver helmet from Empire Strikes Back. One of only two made for the production. They were obviously converted TIE fighter pilot helmets. I was looking for one of these for years and years and years. One popped up and is still owned by uh, a fellow collector in the UK. Uh, and then just sitting at my desk one day, I get an email from somebody and it literally, and as you say, they, sometimes they just come to you. This guy just dropped me a line and said, yeah, I've got this and included a few photos. Amazingly, uh, this guy lived very, very north in Scotland, miles away from me. The, the way he'd got my contact information was the fact that he was a postman in the same post office as a cousin of mine. I mean, it was that random, the connection. Wow. Um, as, soon as, uh, as soon as these photos dropped in my inbox, I knew exactly what it was. Um, it was actually quite a journey to secure this piece as well. Uh, because there was a lot of talk about uh, how this helmet was stolen from a collector way back in the early 90s, I suppose it would have been. Uh, and so what I did was, and, and there were no good photos from that time of it either, so we couldn't photo match it to the stolen helmet. So I went back to that collector. Uh, I don't know, Jim Stoll or Stevenson, does that mean anything to anybody in the room here? No, you may be all too young, but he was one of the major toy dealers in the UK for Star Wars toys. I went back to him disclosed what had been shown to me. He had basically never filed an insurance claim for it, so it didn't belong to an insurance company. I had to establish that first of all. I then had to draw up a contract with him, and I paid him a sum to buy him out of the rights of re trying to reclaim on it at a later date. And then I went back to the guy who had offered it to me. I had to draw up a contract with him as well, explaining what I'd done. Then I flew to Scotland, bought another seat on the plane, and I flew it back home again, and I just was like, oh, it's amazing. I mean, it was just a mind-blowing event. Very cool. Astonishing. Question? I'm wondering uh, what percent of your collection is on display somewhere as opposed to in storage? And if those displays are private, if they're on loan to museum, do you swap out different parts of your collection? Uh, all that. We had a section at the end of this on displaying your items, but I don't think we're going to get there. So uh, I think the short answer is we try to display as much as we can. I mean, that's part of having the thing is, is seeing it, appreciating it, and enjoying it. I think all of us at some point probably have loaned things to museums. So, you know, you like to get things out. You know, we prop store, we have a booth downstairs, we have things on display. We like people to see them. It's part of the fun is, is sharing, especially with other people who appreciate it. Yeah, I, I mean, I was going to say, I have, I think, most of my props and costumes on display. Um, but where it does get harder is like all the paperwork and some and the art and stuff where there just isn't enough wall space. So things that I love, but a little harder just to have out. And then in terms of sharing them, yeah, lent, lent, I've, I've lent things to places and, you know, I've shown people, but it's not exactly a museum or anything like that. It's just my house, you know, so. Yeah, and similar for me, you know, I've, most of my props are on display in the house. 
Um, and and it, it's a you know it's a, it's our residence, and we have you know people come over all the time. But it's it's not like o uh, open to the public, and so the way to get the public access to it is loaning to museums, which I've done a bunch of times. So this is my find in the wild story, and it's not Luke's belt or an ad ad helmet. It's it's a production made but unfinished Rebel Trooper blaster from the Empire Strikes Back. And the reason I'm sharing this is that it's just a really great story. I've spent a lot of time in the past trying to track down people who worked on the films. And around 2003, 2004, I specifically sent a bunch of letters, old school letters through the post to loads and loads of people, a lot of letters, which uh, from an efficiency perspective, not very good. You know, the, the return rate, very low. But I did get a couple of interesting hits. And two years ago, when COVID started, I got this random email off the back of my 2004 letter that I sent 16 years earlier. And I pasted the letter here so you guys can read it. Basically, the guy said, due to boredom during COVID, I've been going through my grandfather's house, and we found both your letter from 16 years ago and some things from The Empire Strikes Back. Are you interested? <laughs> so he had this blaster, which I bought from him a couple of years ago. And you can see it's just silver. It's like the raw primer color, never finished. But it's definitely uh, an original production made one from the film and the story which is at the bottom there, is that his grandfather was a carpenter. He built a liquor cabinet for one of the art directors, and the art director gave him this in return. Paid him in props. I think the only reason they responded to your letter is Gus took over a year to respond to their email. So I think <laughs> they, went, they went with you. <laughs> um, not Tom? really uh, as much of a find in the wild, but this is one of those things like, Dave, where you piece it together over two different times, and, and you know, the, the trousers came about a few years after finding the shirt, and the shirt was an eBay find, and you know it just goes down to do your research. It it looked good, and then you know got a better look at the tag, and the numbers matched, and everything made sense, and then I eventually got to screen match it to the shot on the right due to some of the stitching and stuff like that. We'll show a few more before the Oscars music plays us off the stage. Um, <laughs> this is a Rebel Trooper helmet, Stephen. Do you want to comment oh, on this? Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think this is one of the only uh, Endor Rebel Trooper helmets that's out in private hands that we're aware of anyway. Uh, as you can see, it screen matches to this shot here. And it's a real-world flight cap that's then been modified with some vac-forming components around it as well. But great, great piece. Lovely helmet. And with the screen match, he's talking about if you look very carefully at the silver scratches on the green plastic there, you can see they, they line up exactly between the two helmets. This is a slate, Dave? Uh, I'm not sure quite what to say. Uh, if people slate. have ever seen those scenes like in sketches and stuff, you know, action and whatnot. This is uh, now they're digital, but in the old days, tape and chalk and whatnot. And obviously this one says revenge on it, which is pretty cool. Uh, Richard Marquand, who sadly passed away, um, and just wonderful tape and stuff. And I think it screen matches to a behind the scenes photo, which makes it kind of doubly nice, although that is what it is. So yeah. The, um, the last few sections that we were going to cover, which we don't really have time to go into great detail on, was just related collectibles. So we've already talked, touched on the fact that, you know, there's other things like call sheets, slates, like the one we just looked at, other production materials, artwork, especially storyboards, is all sort of collected in the same category. And then we did have a section on displaying your items where we were just going to show some showcases and manuscripts. So we'll see you at Celebration next year. It'll, yeah. We'll yeah. finish there. Yeah. yeah, we'll do the second half. But uh, there's 25 seconds left. I don't know how strict they are on time. Or do we do questions? Question OK, so having worked on movies myself, I can tell you that cast members love to walk away with stuff. Mm -hmm. So have you had any success getting anything from any cast members? And the second question is, is it true that the Han Solo blaster from episode four was recycled during a weapons recycling? I think that's the common theory yeah. on the Han Solo blaster. Yeah. And the actor question, I think occasionally actors have had pieces, you know, famously like Harrison Ford has donated Indiana Jones bullwhips to auctions to benefit charity and things like that. Um, I'm trying to think of a great Star Wars example of an actor. I mean, Mark Hamill has talked about the fact that he yeah, has he things. He's, he's holding on to them, um, but he does have Didn't his he have a lightsaber helmet. that got lost in a He a did. He, yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a story that Mark Hamill's son so, had a lightsaber yeah. that was left in a park somewhere, yeah. so maybe that will turn up one day. Although I will say there's more to that, which is that ILM made Mark Hamill's son a lightsaber that was not a prop used Ooh, in the films, um, and that may be the one... Uh, that was left in the park and now as we opposed feel to better. a real film. On an emotional roller coaster, you've taken us on. Yeah. And I've, I've gotten a few things from actors. Uh, and I, one, one of my, after you walk mass, one of them came from one of the, the principal actors. So, oh, yeah. you know, actors of, all, you know. Ewok. An Ewok mask from Return of the Jedi. So, you know, actor, yeah, a lot of actors put up things for auction or private sales all the time. So. Cool. All right. 
Do we keep going for other questions, or is it hard we'll out? Go a couple more minutes. Minutes. Yeah. Gus, what are the yeah. rules? Yeah, yeah, the rules are we're at we're at time, but if we have like maybe take one more question. One more question. Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. Just flash through the remaining yeah. slides. Like, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Ah. Hmm. Well, okay. Yeah. So I'm a collector, and I just been tasked by my financial people to put together a trust to handle my collection. Mm. So how did you get your stuff valued and insurance them off for that lovely moment when you die and somebody has to get rid of all your stuff? <laughs> you know what, that's a really great question. And, it, and obviously as we're all getting a little bit older, certainly I'm getting a little bit older, um, it's, it's on my mind as well. Um, I think you can go through an official appraisal process, so you need to be, certainly in the US anyway, you need to reach out to an appraiser who is registered and certified. Um, but we can certainly assist with the first steps of that, so you can get a sort of a general value on your collection. Um, and then once you have that documented, that's a great starting place for it. Um, and it's, I think the most important thing is sharing that information with family as well, so that other people are aware, because we've seen so many valuable things thrown away over the years that have just been disposed of because, you know, the, the, the main party has passed away without sharing the stories or any documentation or paperwork, etc. So sharing, sharing the information is, is key as well. But I was going to say, what any one of those people that you contact is going to tell you, and you can start this tomorrow, is make your spreadsheet, meaning yeah. what you have, picture of it, date you bought it, what you paid for it. Maybe if you've seen something where you go, oh my God, there was just one in auction, now it's $10,000. Write that down too, because price. that's going to help. It, you know, it's like a house. It's like, what has one sold recently in the same neighborhood? That kind of thing. So you can start that tomorrow just as part of the process. And additionally, you can also document, like, these are the people you would talk to if, if you know, these items came into, you know, someone's hands who's not familiar with it. Like, here are the dealers to trust, the appraisers to trust. And that's a common thing people do in their wills and trust planning. Uh, and also people not to trust. <laughs> no, I was about to say, my wife has a very specific list of do not talk to these four yeah. people. Like, it's like crazy. There are some, like every other, like, hobby, there are the good and the bad. So, yeah. yeah. Thank, thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming in. One last thing. We do have downstairs on display at the prop store booth, we have an original X-Wing fighter model from the very first film, which is a pretty special thing. And I do have up here at the front a screen match X-Wing. Yeah, we have some booklets that show the piece in its full history. And I do have about 20 of those that we can give away if you want to rush the stage. Come on up if you want. And check out the podcast, The Stuff Dreams Are Made Of. Oh, my Lord.